So that leads me to, to the practice of mindfulness or awareness. There are so many terms you can use, concentration, mindfulness, awareness, and so forth. You know, because we don't have much time, I can summarize it by saying what all these words, mindfulness, awareness, meditation, so forth, is saying is you pay attention to the reality with a non-judgmental mind, whatever it is. The problem arises is that when you judge others, and you want others to dance at the tune of your, you know, your order, your dictation, <laughs> just, just non-judgmental, accept as it is. Just as we observe the rain, similarly, when, when we see people also, don't, don't just judge them. Accept their reality, understand their reality. Then there will be conversation, proper conversation. Then there will, there will be proper understanding. And also the benefit of mindfulness or awareness is with mindfulness and awareness, when you are with yourself, you are calm, you are silent, then you are able to see many things in its true form. Then you see the uselessness of harming others, mistreating others, exploiting others. Because normally we don't think. Normally we don't think. Our mind is always running towards the external objects. And somebody said that in a day, more than 47% of our life remain totally distracted. In fact, half of our life is we spend sleeping, right? Then in the day, you get distracted here and distracted there, including food and so many things. So when do you get time to do this meditation, to do this practice? We really don't spend much time. So therefore, it is really, really important, whatever you want to call it, meditation, mindfulness, whatever you want to call it, that doesn't matter. What is important is pay attention to the reality, the situation as it is happening right now. Live now. Don't just exist, but live. There's a difference between existing and living. Most of us are existing, but not living. So we must live. Live means enjoy the present moment. Like, for example, this gathering, this meeting, enjoy. It's a wonderful opportunity. So I normally tell people, today is cash, tomorrow is post-dated check. Okay, tomorrow, nobody knows what will happen tomorrow. Of course, we need to make certain plans, certain, you know, preparations, but the most important thing is if you pay attention to the now, future will be taken care of by your presence, by your practice, by your living today, future will be taken care of. So that, that is basically mindfulness meditation. Especially in today's world, people are so distracted, so distracted by the things that is flooding in the market, you know, everybody says, like, they're all for distraction. If you know how to use it properly, it is useful. I'm not trying to be cynical. But if you misuse it, this is the real source of distraction. Because I've seen many young people, boom, then you sit. Then you're sitting there, boom, again you sit. You know, spend your whole day like going after this ping pong, you know? <laughs> so, we go so much outside, nothing inside. So the inside, if you imagine your body as a, as a, as a house, Nobody is taking care of this house. It is getting dusty, it is dilapidating, and the owner is going somewhere. Maybe in the market, in the shop, or wherever it is. The owner is away. Day and night, the owner is gone. So this house is full of you know, dust, cobwebs. That is the situation. I mean, you, if you look at the so-called modern facilities, like mobile phones are for connecting with other people, right? Right? Then similarly, internet and all these are for connecting with other people. How would you connect yourself? Do you call yourself? Sometimes as a reminder, maybe. So, no, so, so how would you connect to yourself? How would you know yourself? Through mindfulness, through awareness, through meditation. And if you start doing this a little bit, don't see it as a religious subject if you don't feel comfortable with that. If you start doing this, you will feel how happier you are, how alert you are, how cognizant you are. You will know so many things. So that's why this day I describe that one of the biggest modern problem is people don't know how to live with others and also don't know how to live alone. You see, this is, this is the problem. If you don't know how to live alone, you should know how to live with others. If you don't know how to live with others, you should know how to live alone. In both of this area, we, we are not good. And, and I was surprised when some people came to me and said, Geshila, do you live alone? Yes, I live alone. And they asked me, Geshila, don't you feel lonely? I mean, the strange, very strange things are happening in today's world. <laughs> really. So, 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 so I told them, my dear friend, I have no time for loneliness. <laughs> really. Loneliness, people feel loneliness when they really don't know how to have shared love and affection and real friendship with other people. Even if they, they live in a big city. It's, it's, it's a pathetic situation, really. Imagine like a place like Delhi, 
which is now 20 million or something. In a city with 20 million population, there are a number of people who are suffering from loneliness. Whereas some of our Tibetan meditators who spend their whole life in the mountain are not suffering from loneliness. So from there also you can see much is to do with your mental approach, not so much about how many things you have, how many friends you have, how many, you know, you mix with the you know, crowd or not. That's not, not, not the situation. It, it's your mind. It's your mind, right? So that's why, you know, whenever His Holiness gives a public talk, at the end of the talk, he normally says, okay, thank you very much. Be happy. These days, you know, the problem is people say when somebody is suffering, having problem, then they go to some teacher and then they'll say, oh, you are suffering, you have problem, do meditation. I don't think this is a very healthy one. Meditation must be done when your mind is happy, not when your mind is miserable. When your mind is suffering, miserable, how can you meditate? Very difficult. Unless you are happy, you will not be able to achieve anything. So therefore in Buddhism, when, when, when it explains the six perfections, out of which one is to do, to do perseverance, effort. Perseverance or effort has been explained by saying, Perseverance means delighting in, you know, doing virtuous practices, delighting in living a good life, delighting, see, when you, when you enjoy something, when you have that happiness in doing something, it's so easy to do anything. When your mind is like pulling back, reluctant, unwilling to do, your mind is not happy, even if you're surrounded by the best of the friends, best of the food, best of the facilities, you're not able to enjoy anything. That is our common experience. Now, what has been explained in Buddhism is very strongly supported through scientific findings. Like, for example, in the case of happiness, like, for example, if you develop greed, so I'm now talking about if you want happiness, what is the obstruction to happiness? The obstructive factor for happiness is negative emotions, like anger, jealousy, and countless negative emotions. Now, if you look at these negative emotions, their nature, how harmful and how destructive they are, you will find, number one, please remember this, this is very important. Number one, all these negative emotions are narrow-minded. Look at this. There's no holistic attitude, narrow-minded. If you, with, with desire, with attachment, even if you love somebody, they'll say, I love you only, no one else. How narrow-minded. What, what is taught in Buddhism is loving all sentient beings. Similarly, when you develop anger and hatred, then you pinpoint to just one person and will say, this person is the problem. He, she alone is the problem. He, if he, she is eliminated, there will be happiness. So from the Buddhist, Buddhist perspective, and also it is the reality, things happen due to multiplicity of causes and conditions, to many causes, not just one single cause. So if you are able to take into consideration the involvement of this multiplicity of causes and conditions, you will have a broader perspective. You will not keep on blaming just one. And you, you also have played a part. Your suffering means you have also played, you presented yourself as a target. So these negative emotions are narrow-minded. And these ne negative emotions, they don't have a solid foundation. The positive emotions, why you develop love, why you develop compassion, if somebody asks you the reason, you have 100,000 reasons to explain those, the importance of that. But if you are to explain why you are angry, there may not be much. There really may not be much. Of course, you will come up with some answer, but there will not be much. And especially when you are asked, is it even if there are some reasons, and if you are pushed further and said, okay, there may be some justification for your anger, but is the anger solution? You will not be able to say that this is the solution. And also, in fact, if we are not, not like scrutinizing these factors. If we look carefully, we will be able to know that. For example, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody who right in the morning says, I want to get angry, who makes a motivation saying that today I will get angry? No. Because you have some inkling of idea or some sense that anger is not good. You have that idea. But somehow you go to work and meet different people, you know, uh, probably meet strange co-workers and then you get angry. You might, you know, uh, pick up a little bit, fight with that person. But at the end of the day, when you look back and see what has happened in the day, again, you will find nobody who will say that I fought with somebody so I really enjoyed the day. So these things, you know, I, I'm just giving you some hint. And now because not many people are believing in religion, they think without any study, they think, oh, religion is difficult, you know. So His Holiness is saying secular ethics, meaning that we all want long-lasting happiness, as we all agreed. And if you want a long-lasting happiness, it has to come from basic good human values like loving kindness, compassion, and so forth. So secular ethics is based on the concept that we must practice and adopt this positive emotion, cultivate these positive emotions and positive values, not because they are said by God or said by Buddha. In today's reality also, the real great thinkers, they are paying more attention to the soft power, not on the hard power. Only arrogant, ignorant, short-sighted, 
dictators or other stupid leaders, they talk about guns, they talk about arms, but the real thinkers, they talk about soft power. Soft power means power of culture, civilization. So therefore, now, now scientifically speaking, if you, as I said, if you develop these negative emotions, then the brain releases a substance which is called dopamine, dopamine. And then you feel like, you know, going for that again and again. Attachment increases, hatred increases, then you get addicted to it, right? So these negative substances are released physically or in terms of brain also. So there are a lot of, lot of scientific uh, findings which support what is being said in Buddhism or what, what is being said based on common sense.